Sure. Um, hi, so I'm Gwenidi. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Um, and Arya is my PhD student. Uh, she's in her third year and um, she's working on a couple of different projects um, related to the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and her background is in computer science. So uh, she definitely fits in with the, the AstroStats group here. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, let Arya take it away. Thank you. So um, thank you for the introduction, Gwen. Um, again, I'll let you know that I'm Arya Patil. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, University of Toronto. And today I'll be presenting some work that I'm doing in collaboration with uh, Joe Bowie, Gwendolyn Eady, and Sebastian J. Mungal. Um, and the topic that I'm talking about today is likelihood-free inference of chemical homogeneity in open clusters using functional principal components. Uh, it's a rather big title, but I just want to highlight here that the main astrophysical object of study uh, that I'm working with is open clusters. And the two different statistical techniques uh, I'm working on are likelihood-free inference and functional principle components analysis. And I will go over all of these concepts um, during the talk. So, uh, first off, here you can see a very beautiful image of M67, which is an open cluster, and this has been imaged by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and um, a brief introduction of open clusters is that uh, it is a group of uh, gravitationally bound stars that are thought to have formed from the same gas cloud or molecular cloud at the same time. And the question that we'd like to ask is how chemically homogeneous are star clusters and can we constrain this chemical homogeneity? And the reason that we would like to do uh, this is that um, when an open cluster forms out of a giant molecular cloud, um, as you can see on the slide here, um, the cloud is expected to have a lot of turbulent mixing within it. And therefore, we expect that the chemistry of the cloud is more or less similar. And therefore, the stars that form out of this cloud uh, should ideally have uh, chemical abundances or essentially just the amount or composition of different chemical elements to be similar. Um, and the reason that I've mentioned initial chemical abundances is because with time, the chemistry of stars changes or evolves but uh, we expect there to be homogeneity in the chemical abundances that are there when they form at the uh, very beginning. And the motivation behind studying this topic is um, we would like to learn more about the evolution of star forming clouds. So here in this image, you can see this very detailed picture of how uh, dense molecular clouds go through star formation. And then there's these the processes that go into this um, procedure. And while it's very complicated, it's amazing that we know so many of the steps um, in these um, processes. But the one thing that we don't know much about is the first step of star formation, because these are often obs uh, obstructed from our view, because we don't have sort of um, first order light that's coming from there. So that's why if we are actually able to constrain chemical homogeneity, we'll know how this turbulent mixing and how the standard picture that we know from simulations actually works uh, in reality. And we can constrain things like the formation and um, properties that uh, determine this pr procedure. And the second motivation behind our project is something called chemical tagging. The idea is that open clusters get um, dispersed over time, over time scales of like uh, 100 mega years or so. And uh, the idea is that if the chemical signatures are uh, essentially similar, we can reverse trace them back to where they were formed just by their chemistry. And if we can do that, then we can go beyond the um, sort of broad brush, brush picture of dynamical and chemical evolution of the galaxy that we have right now and actually trace 
each and every um, star to where it was uh, first formed. And to do that, um, I will come back to the uh, actual problem that we are solving, which is to constrain the level of initial abundance spread in star clusters. And this is a difficult problem because A, we have a lot of observational uncertainties. Um, so for example, I've mentioned 0.1 dex, where dex is essentially a measure of order of magnitude. Um, and it tells you that um, the pipeline that Apogee, which is um, one of the surveys that gives us the spectral information for stars, gives a lot of um, uncertainties. And these are due to a lot of factors um, right from the instrument to things happening within uh, the interstellar medium while the light is traveling towards us um, and some um, other noise factors that we don't really know of and can't characterize well. Um, and the second problem is that there are effects of stellar evolution that change the chemistry of stars over time, as I mentioned. Um, one of the examples is atomic diffusion. Um, and it's very hard to quantify how much of this effect causes the change in chemistry. And this adds another level of uncertainty to our analysis. Um, so if in case we are able to constrain this, uh, we like to determine the chemistry of a large sample of stars and then uh, do this method of chemical tagging. And that's sort of the hope of this project. And now I'll be actually getting into the statistical methodology. And the idea is that we would like to constrain the abundance of um, a single star uh, by constraining the posterior distribution, where the posterior is the probability of the stellar model given a noisy spectrum. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to take this posterior for each and every star in the cluster and then get a scatter of abundance from it. Um, and I'd like to highlight that the model uh, includes um, parameters like effective temperature, gravity, um, or log G, um, and a bunch of abundances. Um, and here I've just shown an example spectrum, um, which is um, a function of wavelength. And uh, this is continuum normalized, um, which means that the black body radiation curve has been removed. And we just sort of observe the variations from this continuum in this plot. Uh, Arya, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this continuum normalization clearly is a uh, big deal, right? I mean, we had an illustration of this with this phosphine uh, issue recently. Um, have people factored in this kind of uncertainty into this point one dex, uh, you know, essentially the systematic uncertainty of where we put, where um, continuum gets put uh, into the calculations uh, in the optical? Um, so when I mentioned the point one dex, which is in the initial um, sort of pipeline, uh, I won't say that there's a specific um, uncertainty calibration of the noise in the continuum normalization itself, because it is um, like, essentially, we're doing a quadratic fit, and then dividing um, the spectrum by this uh, continuum normalized quadratic fit. Um, and then we do the whole analysis. Um, and the uncertainties on each and every pixel um, are usually not including the uh, issues that you might have because of issues in the normalization. Okay, so that essentially that would be an, uh, that, you know, um, that would be an additional uh, contributor. Right, because this yeah. goes into the pre-processing step, but um, essentially it's um, hard to quantify how and where it's not working well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I'll talk about how we can at least try and um, cater to the fact that there are some uncertainties that we haven't quantified properly. Um, 
so um this is sort of the full picture of the statistical methodology i'm uh, following and right now um i will go through each and every step uh, through the talk but the first thing i would like to uh, focus your attention towards is um conversion of data which are discrete measurements over um wavelength to a functional data form using functional principle component analysis um and why that is important in this uh, likelihood free inference procedure that i'm using which is um shown in the rest of the slide so the first thing uh, that i'd like to mention is that the data that we are using is uh, from apogee the apache point observatory galactic evolution experiment uh, which gives us spectra of uh, stars which has a dimensionality of about 10 to the 4 uh, wavelengths um and to the right i'm showing um um an example an hr diagram of the open cluster m67 that i'm working with right now and essentially we have all of these stars and each of these stars corresponds uh, to a spectrum as shown at the bottom and um the reason that uh, i'd like to hi i highlighted the number of wavelengths that are going into this uh, spectrum is because of something called curse of dimensionality um which is the essentially the idea that um if you have too many dimensions or if you're working with too many dimensions then um your model is not going to be efficient enough and as your um dimensionality increases often times uh, your computational time um sort of grows really large and the solution to this is that we'd like to find the low dimensional intrinsic structure that might be present in these spectra and we know that that uh, is often times true for a lot of uh, stochastic systems because um essentially the data is a realization of processes or internal uh, processes that are governed by certain parameters which are low dimensional and uh, quite a common technique to do something uh, like this or dimensional reduction is principal component analysis as we all know and uh, principal component analysis is a really powerful technique because it essentially gives us a way to look at the covariance um or correlation functions of data uh, that uh, are more informative essentially because we get orthogonal spaces that explain most variability in the data but the problem with the data that we are dealing with is that as you can see at the bottom there are these gray regions which are essentially what we call mask regions in um apogee um and so the i the problem is that a we have a lot of mask data and b we have a lot of uncertainties on each and every um spectral points so if we want to deal with noisy and missing data uh, there's an addition to principal component analysis called expectation maximization pca and essentially what it does is that it's it adds a step of expectation maximization to the regular principal comp component analysis method and it takes into account all the uncertainties in the data so you can look at it as a sort of weighted principal component analysis and if we use something like this on our apogee data here i have shown uh, 10 principal components by doing empca on 50000 apogee spectra um and i've mentioned that i take some criteria about what these stars are that is in terms of ion abundance and the log g um and this sort of a work was done previously um and they showed that um the first few principal components especially till pc7 show a lot of features in the spectrum that we might expect due to absorption lines and these are the kinds of things that we want to find out from our data as you go from pc8 to pc10 
you see these sort of long-term features. And especially if you look at the first um, band of PC8, it seems like it's uh, due to an issue called persistence in the instrument, which is when uh, you observe a star that's really bright. And then when you do multiple observations after clearing out that measurement, there might be some residual of the previous measurements. And this is quite common to be uh, happening in Apogee, um, but it has been masked out um, by the mask that is provided. But the problem is that due to certain other uncertainties, uh, it's not characterized well. And that's the problem with EMPCA. It doesn't do well or well enough if the noise characterization is imperfect. Um, and that is the problem that we have with Apogee is that we'd like to know this noise before we can do an analysis like this. So this is where we uh, came towards uh, using something called functional principle component analysis or the functional version of PCA. So um, the idea behind or the motivation behind FPCA is that if we consider our data, which is essentially just uh, discrete measurements over wavelength, uh, it is coming from a process or coming from a functional process that generates it. And if we can take this discrete data and convert it to a function over wavelength, and then if we do a principal component analysis on it, then um, it will let us know much more interesting features that are present in the data. And this um, for FPCA comes under the umbrella uh, field of functional data analysis, where all of these methods essentially just take or exploit the fact that our data comes from some functional forms. And just to highlight uh, how this could be used, um, I've uh, use these figures from functional data analysis by Ramsey and Silverman, which is a really good and fundamental book uh, for doing this sort of uh, analysis. Um, to the left, um, it's shown that you have some um, temperature measurements from January to December of different uh, cities um, in Canada. And you have um, these sort of um, the four measurements uh, or four observations. And what you can see in this by just looking at the figure is that there seems to be some sort of periodic um, variation in the temperature that we expect to see um, usually. But there's also some detailed structure that's going on uh, within these periodicities. And the idea behind uh, using FPCA on this is that we can decompose these data using a Fourier series, which is quite similar to doing, say, a Fourier analysis. Um, and these Fourier series will become something called a basis for your data. And then you'll make a linear model out of these Fourier series, fit it to your data, and then convert it to a functional form. And then once you have the functional form, you can essentially do a procedure that computes uh, principal components given this continuous uh, format. And to uh, the right, you can... Are you, sorry, quick uh, question here. Um, so I'm slightly confused by this PC1. Um, why, is, why does it show a reverse sort of uh, dip uh, in the middle of the year, uh, during summer? Right. When... Um, so I think first off, the principal components here are after mean subtraction. Um, so we take all these um, sort of the measurements, we can essentially fit a basis function to it, or maybe we can fit a basis function to the centered observations as we would usually do in principal component analysis. And then once we do that, we find these principal components. So what they are showing is what is the variation from the mean spectrum. So looking at the data, it seems like the mean spectrum should just look like a simple sinusoid. 
um, but it shows like there's a smaller dip than we would expect in the um, sort of the peak of the sinusoid. And maybe it gives us an idea of how the temperatures are maybe not just peaking and going down. There's a sort of flattened feature there. And all like as you go from PC1, PC2 to PC4, you're seeing that it's showing way more structure in. Is, is it, a, um, uh, is it a, a consequence of using a sign as, a, as the basis function here? Or is that, uh, or am I misinterpreting or, or interpreting this? Uh, so I did, so it does use, uh, as I said, four year series. And you heard, I think they're using like 12 four year series. Um, and I think the idea is that since we know there's periodicity in the data, we can cleverly use some basis functions that um, we expect to have some explanation in the data. So it's almost like we are trying to find an orthogonal basis um, if that if we take a large enough uh, sort of size of these uh, basis functions, then they should explain um, the data really well. Uh, so if you say you take 12 or let's say you take 100 or so of these series, then you're essentially trying to do as good of a job as possible to fit your data given the domain knowledge you have about what you want to expect and then you can do your principal component analysis on it. And okay. um, so, yeah, I think the PC1, PC2, it's, there's like an explanation about how this um, variation can be explained with um, season, like the seasonal variations and stuff like that. Um, so they've done a sort of quite a, detailed analysis of interpreting the principal components as well. Okay, thank you. And just to show you, because um, you mentioned about what uh, our basis functions uh, that were used for the other problem. One of the example basis functions is the Legendre polynomials, which are uh, essentially ortho orthogonal and um, we, if we take a large enough sample, then we are going to the sort of like complete set of these polynomials. So the idea is that if we um, have a data set and we have some sort of an idea of what functional forms could fit the data, then we can use cleverly use basis functions that explain the variance in the data rather than the variance in the noise. Um, and to just go over sort of like the mathematical procedure that's used, um, the data that we have or the raw data, which are essentially n observations um, over some x, which is usually time, or it can be any sort of domain. Um, so in our case, it's going to be wavelength. And we know that this raw data is noisy. And so what we would first like to do is we would like to regress the raw data onto uh, basis functions, uh, which as I mentioned, come from domain knowledge. And then we essentially just do a simple um, regression or uh, say you can do a least squares regression to find these beta values, which are essentially uh, similar to the weights that we have um, when we are doing principal component analysis. Um, and then once we have these um, regressed um, basis functions to the data, we can use something called the Mer Mer Mercer's theorem, which essentially gives you an, um, so on the uh, left is the covariance function of your data, or essentially it's an estimate of the covariance function of your data. And you can um, expand this covariance function as um, a set of phi's, uh, sorry, size, which are eigenfunctions, 
um, and corresponding to them, you have Ks, which are the eigenvalues. Um, and then using the functional form of your data, you can get an estimate of the covariance function. And then um, instead of taking an infinite uh, space of these eigenfunctions, you can convert it to a finite dimensional problem and then get a set of base um, set of functional principal components from your covariance function. And um, the procedure that I'm using specifically for my method um, is that let's say you have two different observations, n equals one and n equals two of spectra. Um, and the black dots essentially tell you that you have discrete measurements um, over wavelength. And then the basis functions that we are using are, for this particular example, 10 theoretical spectra. So the idea is that we can simulate some theoretical spectra, which um, would only explain variance in your data that's expected by the processes that we understand or the physical processes that we understand. So if we take these basis functions and do a regression to our data, uh, and you can use as many basis functions as possible, um, there's sort of like a bias, bias variance trade-off between that. But the idea is that if you take a large enough uh, basis function sample, then you can fit for your data really well, as you can see here. But at the same time, there will be certain regions that won't be properly fit because of the fact that your theoretical spectra cannot explain some things which are specific to noise or some things that our models don't incorporate. So it could also be a physical process that our model doesn't incorporate. But this essentially lets us see what all processes or what all information in the data we are missing through these theoretical explanations. And just to give you um, a sort of visual representation of how these principal components look like, um, I've again showed the uh, first 10 principal components using uh, this procedure. Um, and I think I mentioned here 1,000, but these are uh, actually 50,000 Apogee spectra that I've used. Um, and as you can see from PC8 to PC10, you're not seeing those long-term features that you were seeing in EMPCA, or you are not seeing these feature, the sort of um, trends that you would expect. Like for example, when you were asked, uh, when, when I was ask, asking about continuum normalization, if there are any quadratic features in your principal components, then that might be a, uh, the problem of not doing continuum normalization well, because the uh, the reason we did continuum normalization with a quadratic fit was to remove these sort of um, any sort of features that we would expect any linear or uh, quadratic features, and if we do see them in our principal components, then that could be a sign that it's not done well. Uh, and that is what we see if, for example, in our basis functions, we can include Legendre polynomials as well. So we can take, for example, say 50 theoretical spectra and also consider a constant, um, a linear and a quadratic function. And then if we do the same analysis by just adding these three functions, the analysis will try and fit for any linear variations or any quadratic variations. And then in your principal components, you'll see what difference it makes to add these sort of basis functions. And that will illustrate what, where all do we need um, these quadratic features or linear features uh, to explain as much variance in the data as possible. But that could not be, or that might not be variance in the actual um, physical processes that we want to measure. And here I've just shown uh, a cumulative explained variance of how uh, this procedure would work if I do uh, 50 principal components uh, with 50 basis functions. And as you can see, right till um, 
about the first five or so principal components, you reach quite a high um, percentage variation. Um, and this essentially is telling us that with just 50 um, spectra that we've included in our basis functions, we could explain most of the variance in our data um, without having to rely on um, any other functions. And to give you an example about how this fit looks like, uh, here in black, I've shown an M67 red giant spectrum. And in orange, I've shown the model spectrum that I get um, by doing uh, functional principal component analysis. Uh, and I've here, here used 10 of these FPCs. Uh, and the, at the bottom, you can see residuals. And uh, the reason I wanted to show this is that I want to highlight some of the things that FPCA does really well, which is that since it's a functional form of your data, you can essentially have mass regions, but you can fit for all your basis functions um, despite having mass regions and you can compute uh, what the spectra should look like in these regions just based on the fact that your spectrum is of a star and these mass regions should follow the, pr the processes that the other regions um, are showing. So here in the middle, you can see that uh, it's generating um, data for the mass regions. And also uh, to the left and right, you can see that it's um, essentially removing some of the features that we expect to uh, see due to some either issues in instrumental noise. Um, it's hard to quantify where that is coming from, but we do know that these features are not theoretically expected. Um, and that was, whoop, and that was sort of the description of um, the functional principle component analysis I'm doing. And now comes the actual procedure of inferring something from these uh, principal components. And for that, we use something called density estimation likelihood-free inference, which is a new Bayesian inference method uh, in simulator models where we don't know what the likelihood of our data is, or essentially we can't compute um, this likelihood. Um, and simulator models are really common in science and engineering where we often have stochastic systems and we can explain them with simulators, but they are not analytically explained well. Um, and the procedure goes as follows. You have some simulator. From that simulator, you generate some parameters, theta, and or you take some parameters using a prior and then you simulate uh, data for those parameters and you get this sort of set. Then you use this set to fit for a likelihood uh, given some weights where the weights resemble um, how your likelihood model is going to be. Um, and then from this fitted likelihood, we obtain the learned likelihood at the data point that we observe. And then the next step is essentially we can take this learned likelihood function and use that as a new prior and then simulate more data so that we essentially come down to the parameter space where our data is observed. And um, the way it does it really well is um, by using active learning in this procedure, which I mentioned that is using um, posteriors that we get from each and every step get more parameters in the relevant parameter space, and then using neural density estimators, uh, which are essentially neural networks that fit for the probability density or likelihood. And this finally comes down to the procedure that I was talking about, which is that your data observed is the spectrum that you have. Then you take that data, you convert it to a compressed spectrum uh, using functional principal component analysis. And we just showed that you can explain your data really well with just about 10 components. So you can take your data from um, a similar to 10,000 dimensional space, uh, convert it to a, about 10 to 50 components, and then 
Um, you can also take simulated data from a simulator, um, compress that data down as well. And then you train a neural density et estimator on this simulated data and essentially sample that or ob uh, obtain that at the um, data that you observe. And you keep repeating this procedure so that you finally come down to a parameter space that's uh, most interesting for your data. And just to show you what would be the final output of such a procedure. Um, so here I'm showing a posterior distribution of uh, five different elements, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, manganese, and iron. Um, and the blue lines here represent uh, the preliminary uh, estimates that Apogee gives by doing a simple chi-square minimization procedure. Um, and while our um, estimates do uh, come pretty close to this um, value, it essentially tells us how well it's um, distributed and what are its uncertainties are. And it's able to constrain that pretty well as well. And just to give you an idea of what we would uh, like to see at the end of this procedure is getting posteriors for all of the different stars in M67. Here, uh, I've shown a few giant members from M67 and um, plotted the uh, posterior distributions at the bottom and the ASP cap or the preliminary pipeline estimates uh, for these um, abundances. And on the top, I've uh, shown uh, signal to noise ratio in black, um, which I've scaled down to show percentages. Um, and then in or, uh, purple, I've shown um, the masking percentage of your data. That is in each and every spectrum, how much of the data is masked. So that gives us an idea of how well the fit should be for um, the different spectra. And as I've mentioned, this is work in progress. So we are still working on constraining the posteriors really well and finding uh, good neural density estimators that would uh, fit for the likelihood really well. Um, and I'd just like to um, conclude by saying that um, using FPCA, we have successfully re reduced the dimensionality of chemical space. Um, and FPCA plus uh, Delphi shows promising results um, for fast and accurate uh, inference of abundances. And right now we are constraining the abundance scatter of M67 open cluster. But our idea uh, or our plan is to essentially apply this technique to the um, entire Apogee DR14 data release uh, to measure abundances and uh, explore chemical tagging. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Arya. That was very nice. Uh, well done. Uh, any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, uh, it was very nice talk. Uh, I was just uh, probably missed that. I have a question about how do you go from this PCA decomposition into actually the abundances? So this step, I probably missed it somewhere. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I actually... Um, so I guess I can quickly... Um, go over some of the steps because I guess I didn't um, explain it that well. But uh, the idea is that if you have the data or uh, the spectrum and you compress it down to some principal components, yeah. so let's say we have a 10 dimensional or 50 dimensional space. Um, and then, so when you have that data, which is um, here the full spectrum, and then you compress it to T which would be the, um, the um, compressed value, sorry. Um, and then if you have a simulator, here the simulator that I'm using is essentially um, polynomial spectral modeling or turbo spectrum, which are these simulators that give us uh, spectra um, from modeling stars. Um, and they tell us that given 
say parameters of effective temperature log g and abundances what should the spectrum look like and then this will give us okay. this simulated parameters theta where theta represents um, the stellar parameters and abundances and d represents the data that we have simulated and then so can... yeah so in your spectrum so each spectrum you basically uh, have a parameter which tells you what is the abundances of that spectrum and then it it is uh, tagged by those abundances because I, you know, I understand the whole process. I just uh, try to figure out where, you know, when you plot your final uh, dependence on abundances uh, and you determine what are the abundances, I just trying to figure out how and where. So for me, the lines in the spectrum indicate the uh, metals in the star, right? So somehow this uh, one of the parameters uh, should be related to that spectrum, right? Right, I guess. so what you said is exactly what um, is happening. Right, so if you have 10 dimensions, is does it uh, really represent 10 different abundances or it represents all 10 uh, different parameters where theta is a combination of these three? Right. Um, um... So I'll just show you the principal components here. Um, as you can see, it's not a very um, nice looking principal component where you can just see certain features. And that's, I think, the main problem with um, constraining how uh, each principal component is explaining uh, mm -hmm. what all information, because there's so many elements and there's so many different lines of a single element. and uh, we also know that there are certain lines that we don't know so well. Um, so if we look at principle component one, one procedure that we are trying to do to quantify how different abundances can uh, are being explained by the principle component is that we are trying to take the basis functions and we are seeing how much or of a single basis function is being explained by an individual fun functional mm -hmm. principle component. And the parameters of those basis functions should give us an idea of how much is being explained in principle component one, as opposed to principle component 10. Um, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. But it's just like hard to know because there's so many different lines in principle component one to 10 that uh, knowing or interpreting principle components is hard. Right, right, right. All right, thanks. So um, actually while you're on this uh, plot, uh, I was confused by the, by the very large number of um, uh, what appear to be absorption lines in all the PCs. Um, you are using a model that includes the piece, uh, includes the absorption lines, right? So why are they, why would they show up in the PCs, wouldn't the PCs just be flat? Everywhere? Um, um, yeah, so that's a good question. So the um, thing is that when I include basis functions, uh, which you mentioned have uh, absorption lines, and when I subtract the mean spectrum from the data, um, the idea or the point is that if you have a, an absorption mean at a particular wavelength, then for different spectra, your uh, value for that particular wavelength is going to change based on how much absorption that star is showing. So for example, let's say you have a spectrum like this uh, and you are looking at uh, a particular wavelength, say 15,200 or something around here. And this particular absorption line is going to change depending on how much of a chemical element is present in that star. So if you subtract out the mean spectrum, you're just going to see linear variations of these absorption lines from sort of the mean uh, value. And this tells us how much of the absorption line variation is happening. And that should quantify how much of the chemical abundance is changing in the star. Right. Uh, 
so um, so I guess that essentially it's like uh, doing a um, uh, doing a fit, uh, except that uh, most of the variation should be in the first few components, right? Why are there? Why do the lines continue to show up in the later components? Right. So I think the um, so again, I am not um, going to be able to give a full answer to this because um, it's something that um, boils down to interpreting the principal components itself. Um, but one thing that is important here is that when you look at um, principal components, like um, say the first component is uh, telling you which all absorption lines are correlated with respect to each other, and then how much of those correlations should be explained by this first uh, principal component. So let's say um, in a hypothetical world, I knew that the first principal component was for iron um, and it showed all the iron lines and how they are correlated and changing. Um, there could be the problem that this is the first order variance, but there could be some substructure within those um, variations as well. And um, just as when you do principal component analysis and you find that the first principal component, say, explains a lot of the variation, but as you go down, um, it's trying to find um, some other correlations in the data that are not explained by the first few, um, which probably are smaller variations in substructure, but are still important. Um, so I think that's why as you go from PC1 to PC10, you still see similar absorption lines. So I think what it's trying to capture is that um, while there are large scale variations in these absorption features, there can be some small scale variations as well. So for example, if you were to look at, um, uh, let's say a subset of uh, stars which which post facto you know uh, have large um, let's say ion abundance uh, versus another subset which has uh, uh, low ion abundance and then if you were to run this thing separately on those two samples you would see that uh, or would you see that in this uh, in the PCs? Um, so you're saying that if I have two different sets and I do uh, the principal component, would I still see the same? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I imagine, I mean, I, so I'm just trying to um, sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of morph my intuition from regular PCA to uh, functional PCA. Uh, so I was just wondering, so if, suppose you know that there are two subsets, one with, uh, one where you know the, the um, uh, FEBIH is high, another one where the FEBIH is low, uh, and then you run this FPCA on those two subsets separately and then just put these uh, PCs side by side. Mm -hmm. um, would you, would, would any of the components <clears throat> uh, show this uh, difference uh, uh, in, in any um, uh, obvious way? I mean, it's meaning that uh, would, would you be able to identify that way uh, whether uh, one of the PCs are really describing the iron uh, abundance. Right, that's um, another uh, good question because uh, this is one uh, area that's actually studied in functional principle component analysis, which is that if you have a bunch of data and uh, when you're doing FPCA, you're assuming that these uh, individual spectra or data are realizations from this like uh, latent distribution space. Um, and we are expecting that this distribution is same for all these stars. But the problem is that it could be that different stars have different distributions that uh, from which these stars are or spectra are realized. And so for example, uh, we can talk about giant members versus dwarf members. So it could be that giants have a different distribution as opposed to dwarfs due to their physical characteristics. Um, and so one area in functional data analysis is how can we 
um, cluster this functional data that we get to actually find different sets uh, of data. And one technique that people use is that using basis functions, you can um, fit for your data and get the beta parameters, which I talked about, um, which are the sort of weights of these different basis functions. And then you can take these betas and you can cluster on these um, values. And that should give you a sort of sense of how your data is separated into this large functional space. And that's the idea of uh, functional principal component analysis because we're assuming that each and every spectrum is a point in a large functional space. Um, but the functional space itself could be different for different sets. Um, so we can try and cluster them and find whether um, one cluster has different principal components, whereas the other has different. And then we could see why the variations are changing across them. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, could you could you go back to that flow chart that was towards the end? Uh, this one. Um, yeah, this one. This one. So the the T. Are those just the PCA scores once you project the spectrum onto the PCA basis? Yes. Oh, okay. So then the theta is like the physical parameters. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So is your simulator from a theoretical model, so like a physics-based simulator? Yes. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm using Turbo Spectrum, which um, essentially just uh, does these simulations of star, the model atmospheres of stars and um, calculating spectra. Okay. Um, but in the top part, you, uh, you separately determine from the data, the Apogee data, the, the FPCA basis, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so um, I guess my question here is, uh, in we, we, we may know, or maybe you know, do know that the physics-based simulator is not perfect. Um, so the kind of theoretical spectra you would get out from it um, may differ in, in important ways from the actual spectra from which you formed your PCA basis. Um, but to, when you go through the you know, step five and you're building the neural density estimator to inference, um, you're, put, you're kind of mashing together, uh, you're kind of trusting that the simulator is um, uh, trustworthy and in some sense also assume it's consistent with your PCA basis which you used for the dimensionality reduction. Is there any way you could think about um, testing to see if there's any tension between the predictions produced by the simulator and the kind of dimensionality reduction, reduction you're taking from the real data uh, which you're, you're, you're merging together in this diagram? Right, so um, again that's um one of the important or like difficulties that we do face, which is that um, in the simulators, we know that there are certain features that might not be explained well. Um, and if we do know that these simulators are not complete. Otherwise we would just know how things are working. But um, so, I think the reason we tried to do uh, this functional principle component analysis with using basis functions, which are essentially simulations, was to take into account that we are sort of going from this uh, data space of Apogee to sort of the theoretical space where we think we know the variations that should be present. And then from those basis functions, we get the compressed spectra. And our hope is that by doing this, we are removing some of the features of noise. And we are also trying to look at what all is FPCA not able to explain. So we are seeing whether it's say interstellar absorption or we are seeing whether it could be some other line that it's missing or things like that to just get an idea of how this data can map to uh, the theoretical space um, that we expect. 
Um, and I think right now what we are trying to quantify is where uh, FPCA doesn't do well and whether it is actually noise or whether it's some things that we don't know um, in our data. And so uh, I think our hope is that that sort of first step remove certain features that we don't want in the data or noisy features. And then we are assuming that it's going to be consistent with this, which uh, I know is not a full, fully correct assumption, um, but we haven't figured out how to do, how to quantify well, whether our, this sort of adaptation from the data space to the, um, uh, sure. Well, there, there, there was a paper by Ian Chakala um, in, uh, let me find the uh, link for you in the chat, um, which it wasn't the same as this, but it was, um, what we did was uh, we took theoretical spectra from some kind of simulator um, on, on a grid of physics, physics-based grid of uh, parameters, like mm -hmm. your theta. Um, and we built a, a, a Gaussian process emulator, which was decomposed into PCAs. So actually the, the PCA basis was built from the simulated spectra. Um, and, uh, and, and so what you're, you're doing differently is you're taking the real spectra and you're build, building this FPCA basis. So I think it might be interesting to, you know, if you could take the simulator, generate a bunch of spectra, build an FPCA PCA basis, on the synthetic spectra, and then compare that against the PCAs you get from your derived from the real data, and see if they're consistent. Um, that might be a good test to see if there's any um, tensions in the data. Right, that's the actually a really good point. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. I, um, yeah. yeah, I'll try to do like a um, maybe just simulate, say, a bunch of spectra from the simulator and see whether. Um, the PCs do match in some way, and maybe that could help us know where the variations are. Thanks. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to compare those kinds of approaches. Um, also, can you mention the uh, paper that you said? I put it in the chat. Oh, okay. It's Great. by Jakala, which is pronounced differently from its spelled. Thank you. It's Takawa. <laughs> oh, sorry. I should know I'm in <laughs> Europe now. I should know how to pronounce the Polish names. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, I have one more, actually. Uh, if you go to your last um, results slide uh, where you had comparing the, um, uh, you had a set of about 10 or so uh, elements. This one or? Uh, no, no, the, the, yeah, that one. Uh, so if I understand right, the, uh, the blue, um, uh, the, the, um, the one with the um, uh, posterior density, I assume, is, the, is your, your result and the red bits or the chi-square fits? Right. So it seemed to me that uh, it's uniformly uh, the chi-square fits are overestimating or, or you know, compared to um, the FPCA analysis, uh, the abalances. Is that, uh, is that right? I mean, is, is that uh, the impression that you get from uh, the fuller analysis or is it just this set? Um, right, so um, uh, I'd like to mention that this is um, one uh, part of the project that I'm really like heavily working on right now. So um, definitely I, um, I can say that um, if you look at a few stars, they are constrained pretty well, but for some they are not. And I think the um, work that I'm doing right now is uh, in tuning sort of the hyperparameters uh, to essentially um, find or like con get to a point that we can converge to um, these posteriors pretty well. Um, and 
I think there is still a some amount of work that needs to be done for some of the stars that have uh, these larger sort of distributions. Um, so I would say that I don't trust these uncertainties for now, um, but I am trying to constrain them even more. Well, I, I guess my question is not so much about the size of the aerobars, but more about the uh, the bias that is uh, uh, that seems to be there between, um, let's say, the mode of the FPCA versus the uh, chi-square estimates. Right. Uh, do you, do you trust the, that uh, bias? I mean, do you believe that that's that's real? I mean, your, the error bars might shrink, but would it would the post would the posterior distribution shift? Um, so for now, I would say that there could be some shifts um, based on how like how I'm changing things in the analysis because. Um, over time, I've been trying to improve the functional principle components as well. And this whole procedure relies heavily on the functional principle component analysis. So I would say that unless or until a point that I can quantify the uncertainties for all of these procedures, um, I would not trust the bias that's there here right now. Okay. Um, but the hope is that... Um, Right now, I'm trying to um, get sort of the best possible estimates from FPCA, uh, which we seem to have been um, doing well on for now, and then to rework this analysis a little more um, to quantify uncertainties. Thank you. All right, um, any other questions? Uh, I, I warned Arya before we began that she would be interrupted constantly, but uh, apparently people are, have learned to be too polite. I have a question, uh, if go there's ahead. still time. Um, can you go back to that great uh, flow chart that you were just showing? Yeah. So then going down to the end, so you, you train a, a density estimator, a neural network, uh, so that given uh, theta, you can calculate the probability density on the PCA scores. So that's step four, or that second to last box. Right. Um, and in the last step, you are um, essentially using Bayes' theorem to calculate a posterior on theta. So uh, at that point, are you using MCMC to get theta? Are you, so, well, I guess, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, so it comes down to using the prior that you have in that particular step. Um, and for that, we would need to do MCMC to essentially um, sample for uh, this sort of distribution. Okay, so are you using something like EMC or using a Hamiltonian? Monte Carlo, or what is the type of MCMC? Right. So I think right now I'm trying to use both and see whether there's sort of any sort of change in terms of um, what sort of results I get in the computational time that it takes as well. Because one of the uh, things that I think one of the bottlenecks in this procedure is doing MCMC. Um, and so A, I'm trying to find something that would be fast enough and at the same time um, good, good, give good estimates. So um, for now, I'm trying to do both of them and see how my um, sort of the validation loss that I get from my uh, posteriors look like. And uh, as I'm iterating, I'm seeing how uh, overall my... Um, Convergence of the method is working. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Arya and uh, everyone else. Um, so, if, the, uh, if there are uh, last call for questions, and if there aren't any, uh, going once, going twice. All right. So, thank you, Arya. <laughs>
Uh, well done. <laughs> and let me stop this recording if I can. How do I do this? There we go.